Super stability. Biotensegrity, the super stability hypothesis for biological structural organization. Mr. Churchill, to what do you attribute your success in life? Conservation of energy. Never stand up when you can sit down. Never sit down when you can lie down. Never stay awake when you can be asleep. This transposes into the second law of thermodynamics and is consistent with Charles Darwin in his thesis of uh, survival of the fittest is really talking about the second law of thermodynamics. My friend Sergei Grekovetsky put it uh, very succinctly, species survival is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. So uh, when we're looking at the uh, biological architecture, uh, we're looking for biological least energy architecture which is stability with minimal energy expenditure, mobility with minimal energy expenditure, and the ability to switch back and forth easily, also with minimal energy expenditure. How can we go from a pile of bones to an upright skeleton that supports itself? Well, you really can't. Not without the soft tissue tensional elements. In Greek mythology, Atlas was a titan uh, caught up in the battle between the Olympians and the uh, Titans. The Titans lost, and Atlas was condemned to spend eternity as a column holding up the heavens. So modeling the body as a column has a long history. This soldier is from a, a book of uh, 1889 on the center of gravity of the human body, where they were trying to uh, figure out the best way to uh, load a soldier's equipment so he was in uh, balance, meaning he was uh, functioning as a column. Which brings us to Ida Rolf and her famous stack of blocks uh, body alignment. Here the plumb line goes directly through the center of the ankle joint. The currently accepted model is the inverted pendulum model, but we have a problem here because the uh, center of uh, mass doesn't fall through the center of the ankle, but rather uh, anterior to it, creating a, a torque at the ankle joint itself. This could be troublesome, but it's even more troublesome in the 1889 soldier, where the center of gravity falls uh, anterior to his toes, which would make him uh, tilt over and fall on his face. This would require an external force to push him back, as the muscles can't do it, as they're an internal force. To make any sense of, of this, let's talk about three columns. The Washington Monument, the Eiffel Tower, and Snelson's Tensegrity Tower. Let's start with the Washington Monument, which is 169 meters tall. It's 10 and a half meters thick walls at the base, and one and a half meter thick walls at the top and weighs an astonishing 74,600 metric tons. It is built like the Greek columns, block on block, gravity dependent rigid structures that has dominated our concept of body alignment and posture. Vertical columns can be bad news. Everyone knows that once the center of mass of the Tower of Pisa falls outside its base, the tower will fall over. But not only will towers fall over, they will pull themselves apart because of developing internal shear within the structure, which is really a, a tensional force. But tall columns don't have to fall over to create internal shear. Just the mere weight of the column itself creates uh, shear and tension within the column. The tension is a destabilizing force pulling the column apart, so a column contains the seeds of its own destruction put there by its own weight. So columns are both held together and pulled apart by the forces of gravity, and if a lighthouse tower was made of compliant material, it would look like this. A column is only a column when it is vertical. Lying on its side, it becomes a beam. A beam is how you might describe a quadruped spine suspended on posts. Hang a beam between two posts and it bellies out. A beam also has intrinsic forces that will pull it apart. 
its own weight will create a compression force uh, above its neutral axis and a tension force below its neutral axis. But the spine is not a solid beam, it's more like a chain. And a chain put in this situation would give you another problem. You just couldn't hold it tight enough uh, to keep it straight, and you would end up having a sway back nag. Now here we have a proper horse that we're using for a posted lintel model. Even if we could stiffen the spine, there's still several other problems that we would have to contend with in a post and lintel model. You still have to contend with gravity pushing down on the beam, causing compression and then tension forces, and then transmitting it into the post. But look what happens when it gets in the post. It splits up, you get a shear force and then a lateral force, so the walls are pushing out. The Roman arch, uh, this one in Segovia, Spain, they share a similar story. It allows for spanning a greater distance between posts, but it also pushes out the pillars and walls. If you use the arch for a model of the pelvis, as is frequently done, you end up with forces pushing the femur out, not just down. Long arch spans, such as depicted here in the Pont d'Avignon, uh, present their problems. In this situation, you'll get a force that uh, creates collapsing forces that will crack the structure, and the outward forces uh, then pull it apart. It is the compression that creates the tension, and lest we forget, it is gravity that creates the compression. Let's move on to the Eiffel Tower. It's about twice as tall as the Washington Monument and about one-tenth of weight. Back in my surgical days, I attended a conference on the spine in uh, Paris, and this was the front piece of the cover. Although taller and lighter than a stone uh, structure, it actually is more stable and it could bend like this in theory and still uh, stand, not fall over and not pull itself apart. It could go from a column to a beam, remain uh, rigid uh, and not develop sway back. The secret is in its triangular framework, which is readily apparent just looking at the photographs. Triangles are magical. If you load it at its apex, the forces angle out towards its base and by some miraculous mechanical manifestation, all the sheer forces and tension that would normally tear it apart are actually put to work holding it together. Tension and compression sort of separate from one another, and forces are normalized down with no shear. So again, compression begets tension, and compression gets there because of gravitational forces. Triangles are the only two-dimensional structures that do not deform under pressure. A triangle exhibits emergent properties. These are characteristics that cannot be predicted by examining its component parts. You always have to consider the function of the mesostructure. The triangle is a unit which overrides the functions of the microstructure, the component parts of the triangle. Even when trusses are constructed with rigid materials, we should always be cognizant of the fact that some of the members are under tension and could be replaced by cables. Let's go back to our person standing on a beam. Notice the belly in the beam. Replace that beam, uh, say, with a truss bridge. The bellying of the beam is eliminated. Now pay attention to the loads on the abutments. You all, of course, remember how the loads on the abutments in the arch were uh, distributed where there was a force pushing out against the walls. Not so in a truss. Uh, this is a roof truss, and you see all the forces are distributed uh, normal, that is, at right angles to the ground. Now, triangles have emergent qualities, and they are to be uh, calculated using their meso uh, uh, properties. is not always appreciated by even formally trained physicists. Any frame that is not a triangle is unstable. 
they will collapse of their own weight. Trusses are inherently stable and take a compression load and distribute it into uh, compression and tension using pin joints that are torque free. In three dimensions you have a tetrahedral truss with compression in its more vertical limbs and tension in its space. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but uh, tensegrities are transformable truss structures. As I have mentioned, some physicists do not understand triangles, nor do they understand tensegrities. Here we have an example of that by Dr. Uh, Patrick Johnson, a PhD physicist and Alexander Technique practitioner. It is an excerpt from his YouTube presentation, which is presently available, and I will let him tell his own story. Let's take 100 kilos and put one block on a tensegrity structure and another block just on three rods. The question is, which one has more pressure along the line of the rods? And I'll give you a few seconds to think about this and come up with an answer. You can pause the video if you want. The answer is this one has more compression along the rods. In fact, if you do the calculation, you find that easily for this kind of angle, the pressure can be as much as twice as much or more. Rather than just doing the calculations, uh, let's put this to the experimental test. I have here two frame structures uh, uh, comparable to the uh, model that uh, Dr. Johnson shows. I'll load them with beakers and add buckshot and watch and see how the frames distort. As you can see, it takes twice the amount of buckshot to distort the triangulated frame structure than it does the square frame structure. Dr. Johnson fails to recognize the emerging properties of triangles and instead deconstructs the triangle and measures each structure separately. There are a few more errors in Dr. Johnson's uh, presentation, but I think you get the point. Dr. Johnson does say some very nice things about uh, biotensegrity. He just gets his physics wrong. Behold the famed Firth of Forth Bridge, a two-armed cantilevered truss bridge, a late 19th century architectural marvel. The justly famed naturalist Darcy Thompson looked at it and thought, we could use this to model a dinosaur. Thompson understood that there were compression members and tension members in a truss and that the bridge and the dinosaur needed both. He envisioned the compression elements as bones and the tension elements as the ties. To paraphrase him, seeing the skeleton of a dinosaur was like seeing a railroad track without the ties. And here is the current version of it at the Smithsonian Museum, Washington, D.C. Let's get back to our rigid beam where tension is part of the problem. In a truss bridge and here in a fing truss, tension becomes part of the solution. In the fing truss and in some subsequent examples, it's clear what is tension and what is compression. Anatomists and biomechanics could now envision that fascia, ligaments, and muscles could be tension components of a truss bridge, consistent with Darcy Thompson's model. In a frontal view, the upright spine certainly does look like a column, but of course we all know that this is a deception. But to humor the powers that be, we will continue with this deceit for now. Euler's narrow upright column bends because of the tensional forces within it, which, of course, are the resultant of the external compressive forces of gravity. Just as done in the Fink truss, we can externalize some of the tensional forces to relieve the inner tension. And that gets us to the pup tent model for stabilizing the spine. Take note of the fact that the ropes are attached to the ground. And then we have the ever popular ship mass model, which shows up in volume one, issue one of the journal Spine, 1976. To stabilize a long, thin column, you need a lot of ropes. The internal shear that develops is not in one place, but all along the shaft of the column, causing a bending moment requiring multiple tensioners along the slender shaft. 
and only then do we have stability. None of that happens unless the cables are attached to the ground. The ground is an external force and the structural organization remains gravity oriented. We now get to one of nature's greatest constructs, the spider web, an almost pure tension network until we recognize that the spider web can exist without an external framework. That brings us back to the question, how can we get this pile of bones to organize in an upright stance? We need the structure to have stability with minimal energy expenditure and mobility with minimal energy expenditure and the capability of vacillating between the two. Triangles and trusses seem to be the solution and the closest I could come to a workable model when I started working on this in 1975 seemed to be the ubiquitous uh, construction crane. But rigid truss systems are structurally and mathematically inflexible and their structural integrity is gravity dependent. But there is another truss system that can do the job and it is one I've already alluded to. This is the Hirshhorn Museum on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And sitting in this corner, but invisible in the photograph, is our third tower, Snelson's The Needle Tower, sitting there since 1974. This is a 60-foot tower of compression struts floating within a pretension network of cables. This is an architectural arrangement uh, given the label of tensegrity by Buckminster Fuller. These can be organized in a remarkable array of shapes and sizes from micro to macro. They are lightweight and have omnidirectional stability and their internal structure is unaffected by gravitational forces. Rather than compression begetting tension, tension begets compression with the compression elements floating within a sea of tension. To show how this might be applicable to the vertebral skeleton, let's look at bone. We usually think of bone being compressed by gravitational forces pulling us into the ground, with the resultant ground reaction force pushing back. But in utero, where the bones initially form, there is no compression loading in a gravity field. Bone is formed by the tensional forces pulling towards the central hub. In a tensegrity model, it would be a compression element created by the tension network. It has taken me 17 minutes to get to the actual subject matter of the talk. It would be so much more energy efficient and therefore more consistent with the second law of thermodynamics if the architecture of organisms were inherently stable rather than inherently unstable. Which brings us to Robert Connolly, a professor of mathematics at Cornell University, who showed mathematically that tensegrities have a quality called superstability, and we are integrating that concept with biotensegrity. Here in simple non-mathematical terms, we have a graph that exhibit the varying stabilities, gravity-loaded compression structures going from the least stable to the most stable. Logically, we should be able to continue this line until we hit superstability, but that never happens. The compression frame structure's curve uh, flattens out and never makes it to superstability. If we place our architectural columns along this line, you can see the Washington Monument there, the arch is there, the Eiffel Tower further up the curve, and then we hit the spider web right on the line. It is there we hit a crossover point where the curve of the line is disrupted. There is a leap up into superstability and an explosion into the realm of tension frame tensegrity structures. And there is no going back. There may be a range within tensegrity, but there is no sliding back into instability. This is Nelson's tensegrity tower being erected in the corner of the Hershaw Museum. It is being positioned in place by a few guys pulling on some wires and giving a little bit of a push. Tension is in the system before it's erected. Tension begets compression. Compression elements are independent of gravitational forces and it is mathematically super stable. Let's remind ourselves what we're looking for. We're looking for stability with minimal energy expenditure 
and mobility with minimal energy expenditure. Tensegrity with its super stability seems to be a clear first choice for stability. And that brings us to mobility with instability. Tensegrity trusses are gravity independent and structurally transmutable, and they can flip from one stable configuration to another equally stable form. The forces within them are like the foam in your beer that is continually reorganizing itself, going from one stability to another. So if we are looking for stability in our towers, there's a clear choice in the Tensegrity Tower. Tensegrity is the super stability structure that we can use with various combinations and permutations to model organic structure from viruses to vertebrates, their systems and subsystems. It works equally well at the picometer, nanometer, micrometer, millimeter, sonometer, and full organism level. The second law of thermodynamics dictates that it's time to replace the outmoded column model with the new super stable tensegrity model.